Still on national issues, we look at human trafficking now. In spite of the awareness that has been generated on this, it continues to be prevalent both in the African continent and across board. The United Nations estimates that the total market value of illicit human trafficking is 32 billion US dollars. We know that the US State Department has credited Nigeria for making an effort, but says there is more that needs to be done. So recently, the ONU of IFE empowered some returnees. Let's take a look and then we'll come back and have a conversation on this. Youths of this country are angry because they are hungry. The way we can take them out of hunger is to continue to empower them. It is also a message to all our leaders, both traditional leaders and political leaders, that it is now of a necessity. If you are handing one million, dedicate half of it to empowering the youth of your environment. It's a necessity. We have been trying to create an awareness that there is no greener pasture anywhere. Stay in your country. And we are trying to do our best. The one that came back, we tried to empower them like three weeks ago. And we are trying our best to empower them and uh, make them a better person. Though it is not easy, you know. You know, supporting victims of human trafficking back. You have some of them that are sexually molested, so many things. But uh, we have a official plan for the few of them. We can't take all. We thank Oni for their support, for their assistance, for bringing us back from Oman. Even though they are help and their support, even for me, for myself, maybe I will have died there. We're stranded in Lebanon, our boss, they don't pay us, we don't have anything to eat, we don't have anybody that we can call, that can help us. So when the frustration was much, that was why we decided to make the viral video. And I want to use this medium to appreciate His Imperial Majesty, or Ni of Ife, or Bade Wusi, and it's on Baba today. I want to thank him for his support and care when we were there. He sent us an our strength morning, and even when we came back, he gave us uh, vocational training. We now have Enito Ibironke, a lawyer and social sector advocate, and um, of course, uh, Timothy. Uh, who himself uh, was uh, is once a returnee, of course, and a victim of human trafficking, to give us uh, some insights on this discussion. So, good morning to Eniton. Good morning. Uh, Timothy, I think uh, we're still trying to connect with him, but good morning, if you can hear us. I can hear you. Oh, good brilliant. morning, man. Good brilliant. morning, sir. Okay. Morning. So, I'm going to start with Eniton this morning. Uh, research from 2018, and even till uh, lately, has shown that Nigeria continues to be a major transit uh, point for victims of human trafficking. Um, it also says that the, the figures for f women and children is as high as 70%. I, I want to start with that and get your thoughts on why those figures are so high and what we've really been able to do um, to fix that. Well, uh, the reality is that Nigeria is a country of origin for human trafficking for many push factors. One, the major reason that has been attributed to those high numbers has really been economic issues. You find that a lot of Nigerians find, want to see greener pastures out of the country. They feel that the opportunities within the country are limited. We have a high rate of unemployment. We have infrastructure that does not exist. And we all know that Nigeria does not particularly have any social sector, social security in place properly for its citizens. When we look at health, we'll look at it. So all those myriad of issues that lead to the quality of life is making it, um, making it more attractive for Nigerians to want to leave the country. Now, on the flip side, you find that women generally want to be the ones who are seen, who knows who are seen as being able to to either provide for their family, support their family, or at least want to be of some help, as well as being the more vulnerable 
gender. And so that also amounts for, that also accounts for why we have that high number of women who are victims of trafficking. In the bid to say, I want to make a better life, I want to go, I want to make progress for myself or my family, they fall victims. Uh, yes, indeed, we saw. So that really to answer there. your question, yes. Yeah, the, 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 the ladies in that uh, report um, did uh, share some of their experience and their gratitude. Let's come to you, Tony, to get an insight. Um, first, could you tell us um, as briefly as you can uh, the reason that you chose to leave the country, your experience, and what you've learned uh, since you returned? Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's not really been easy though. Um, all reasons why I, I just um, decided to leave was what she actually portrayed on. One need a better life. You just want to you want to survive. You've got families that look up onto you. You've really done all you could. You know, go to school, do all those things. But yet things still seem so difficult. And um, uh, I decided to take that bold step. Though it's not that easy. And sometimes you think about it like. You know, you don't care about your life no more. You just want to leave. And it's really not been easy, though. And, um, you know, getting there, seeing so many things, even at some point that you, you've you been placing a gun on you your went. head. like Tony, tell us you how to you stop went. Over. Tell us how you went. How did you transit out of this country? Who assisted you? Was it legal? Uh, did you follow a dangerous route? Just give us an idea how you left the country and how you came Actually, back. I actually left through through Shokoto, through Shokoto border to Niger, and uh, not that I actually got any assistance from anyone. Um, remembering that um, some of our, our immigrations uh, collected some part of money that I supposed to travel with, and left me stranded while I was traveling. Um, you know, at some point we were being beaten, electric shocks and all that. But then you, you just want to leave at all costs, uh, staying out there in the cold, no food, no nothing. It's really not been a good experience, though. I wouldn't like. Um, uh, sometimes you just you see you see yourself like, what what has life got to? How meaningful has life really been? When you see dead bodies on the road and and you keep going and just like that, you see some people on the road. You know they have to arm you, do a whole lot of things, injure you and all that. Even some some ladies of ours being raped right in front of you and you can't do nothing. You know, it's really hot and it seems so bad. But then, you know, you, you determine, like, you just want to have life at all costs. You just want to live. You just want to be a better person at all costs. Really not easy. Sometimes when I see the graphics, I, it really it really brings tears out of my eyes, yeah, you know. And you have to return back. I think remembering telling the policeman that anchored me down to Nigeria. Nigeria. You can like, hear me. I'm trying to interject and ask you a question. I'm trying to interject. Um, can you hear me now? Okay. I can uh, hear you. Okay. So uh, since, since you've been back, what has been your experience? What kind of support have you gotten uh, from individuals or government? And how are you finding your feet again? Ever since I got back, no support of whatsoever. I could remember that I... There is a, a, one of the journalists that called me and, you know, promised me that I can. Then there's going to be an NGOs and all that in supporting me. And, but nothing, nothing has forthcome. And um, I just been the way I am. You, know, you want to find life, so it is well. All right, I'm, I'm right. going to bring back. I um, needed to ask that question, so we'll have a, a sort of a sense of, you know, what the experience is like for those uh, who go out. Um, yeah. All right. I'm, I'm going to bring back any Tom um, here. I'm, I'm sure, you know, there is, of course, with the, the cases that you follow, there is a difference between those who are trafficked uh, forcefully, those who are deceived, you know, of course, and told of greener pastures outside Nigeria, and then those who intentionally want to leave and take that journey through the Sahara Desert and, and other places. Uh, figures have shown that in 2018 or 2016, sorry, um, alone, more than 600,000 Nigerians uh, took that um, risk of going through the Sahara Desert uh, to journey to Europe. Um, more than 27,000 of them also lost their lives um, in that um, route. But I, I want you to quickly share on some of the dangers of taking these uh, these decisions and deciding 
to leave your country through those means. What are some of the stories that you've heard of? What are some of the cases that you've also dealt with um, in the course of your work? Yes, um, thank you. So the reality is that the stories are as gross as they are. What usually happens, and I'm glad you made the distinction between those who are trafficked, and that's not by, that's by cohesion, those who actually think that they can go through the Sahara and the Mediterranean and they'll get there. One common factor for those who don't know and go voluntarily is that they assume that the journey will be easier than it is. Yes, the narrative is there, the pictures are there, but a lot of Nigerians, both that we've spoken to and that have even called in on different programs, usually mention and tell you that my own will be better, my own will be different. Friends, you know, there's that optimism of the Nigerian spirit that undermines the danger and the horribleness of this journey. And I'm sure that by talk after talking to a few returnees, you realize that there's always that hope that once I'm able to just make it, and then the smugglers who talk to them as well give a lot of assurances. It's a it's a play on the psychological on the on the psyche of the victims. You know, when somebody convinces you so well that you will make this journey and that you will get there, and then you see pictures or videos or narrative of people who are already there and who are supposedly living a good life, people think they can go. But the dangers that exist are one. The journey itself is terrible. Libya, one of the routes which has gone through Libya into the Mediterranean, Libya is an ungoverned society right now. Libya really has is a failed state. And there's no one government who is actually following and keeping the peace in Libya. So you find that a particular person may have gone through a region successfully. On crossing the route through to another region to continue on the journey, meets another set of bandits. And like Timothy said, the horrors that are seen, women that are raped right in front of them. In fact, situations where in the Sahara, there's no water. And you're packed like sardine in the trucks. If somebody becomes weak or is not, looks like cannot make that journey any further, the person has been, has been reported to have been thrown overboard. And even other passengers who have spent the time on that journey with the person are made to bury their own fellow citizens or journey voyagers alive. So the trauma of it psychologically is already a problem that is ongoing and has been noticed. I hope that we can get to talk about, you know, what, chances or opportunities are available when they're finally back in Nigeria for those who eventually make it back alive. Um, but I, I want you to confirm, you know, how bad the numbers are of Nigerians who currently are still being used as um, sexual slaves or uh, sold into, you know, different, you know, parts of the world um, for in forced labor or sexual um, um, uh, slavery, basically. I know that there's also people who, outside Nigeria today, are still in, in captivity in different parts of the world. How bad are those figures? Well, I would say, the first thing I would say is that, as bad as earlier mentioned, the numbers are high. The thing again with statistics, and exact figures are this. A lot of people, once you're out of Nigeria and you're African, generally tend to claim to be Nigerians. Of course, we know that we can also identify ourselves by how we speak or how we look, but the numbers are high. And you know, one of the things that at, the, at this point in time, I cannot exactly tell you the exact figure of no, the exact figure as at now, but one thing that I can tell you for sure is that. The high number of Nigerians who are either trafficked or who are irregularly in other countries has led to major interventions by the by the by international bodies. Some of which the United Nations, IOM, my um, organization for migration, otherwise known as IOM, and even other European countries, the EU, and in particular, even some of the countries themselves. You have Germany. You have a lot of these interventions that are coming up now on a regular basis, on a really, and that's because of the alarming number of citizens, of Nigerians and Africans who are, who are actually in other countries irregularly. I also have recently the case of where we have Nigerians in Diaspora Commission headed by, headed by Mrs. Abike Dabri, who is Erewa, who is actually seen, we see those ladies in Oman, 
the number, those people that are coming back, that are being brought back, or that are coming back for long training, is just like a tip of the iceberg. Do you know that some people don't even want to come back at all? Regardless of how bad it is. Anita, I will come back to you. I will come back to you in a bit. But let's uh, talk to Timothy again. Uh, as someone who has been through, you know, the rigors of uh, trying to get uh, greener pastures and you're back in this country, what are some of the key lessons that you think the experience taught you? And what would you say to people who want to embark on sometimes really perilous journey? Um, after you take on that, I'll ask you what you require from the government. Uh, thank you so much. Um, as regards that, one thing I would advise those that really want to go, really they don't understand what, what um, they stand to get there. There is never anything that easy on that road. And when I say never anything easy, is it on that sea that they bring thousands of people every day that are drawn and, and are just dead and they just bury them just like that? Or people that die in that still same uh, Sahara, Sahara Desert and all those things. So it's never easy for anyone going through that road. And but then, you know, you just look at the situation of the country itself, that people are here and still find still find it very, very difficult to survive. So they feel like what has life got, like what has life got to offer them? They just want to do this. I really sometimes would not blame them, but I feel like our government could still do more help the, the youths and that are out there looking for jobs. A whole lot of people are stranded here. And when you think about the figures every day, like what these people are going through, it's not really encouraging. Like for somebody who look at it, like, I'm, inside my, I'm, in, I'm in my country and I can't even survive. So what has my life got to do with me then? I could just go out there and, you know, if I survive, I survive. If I don't, then that's it. So if we, the governments can really do the whole lot to Let's, let's, let's just make our country better, a better world. All right. Talking I don't see about no reasons our that country we better. We Any Tom, uh, Timothy, just hold on for a bit. Let's uh, come back to it. Let's uh, look at how we can indeed uh, make this country a little better so the young don't look for how to get out by all means. Any Tom, you've seen what is being done. NGOs, um, IOM. Uh, the federal NAPTIP government, also. NAPTIP, and all of them. Um, where do you think we still are not getting it right? That the psyche of the young people, especially um, within the bracket of, say, let's say millennials, they still believe that it's better to go and suffer elsewhere than here in this country. Where are we getting it wrong, and how can we retrace our steps? Well, one of the places that we need to get it right would be in the place of providing proper social security. People need to be able to have access to know that there's there's welfare services that are there for them. There's health infrastructure. You know, we're talking about normal health, HM, normal basic health insurance that people can have access to. So you, have, you are ill, you need to be able to have money to take care of yourself. You can't have any form of succor. There's no housing, low-cost housing, or some form of access to funds that people can get. So one of the things that is coming up is that one of what has been identified as a gap is the lack of, how would I put it? Well, that's actually in terms of reintegration, shelter and psychosocial support services, which is one of the things that one of the organizations that I'm involved in, we're looking into right now. But then again, that is, a pre, that is actually a remedial action. A preventive action would now be in, the, in terms of actually providing one, when I talk about access to funds, I'm not saying give people just 20,000 naira or 100,000 naira or a million naira, but give them access to funds as well as proper entrepreneurial training. So that means that if you're going to be able to, let them be able to have access to know how to run a business and then access to opportunities outside of the country. One of the things that this era, this pandemic has brought about is an increase in interconnectivity. Virtual, I mean, our virtual world is so connected now. For instance, we're having these interviews via Zoom. You know, so that kind of situation now, when you have young people, when you have those trainings and that access given to them, one of the things that has been realized is that when they, even when money is given to people who are in situations where they need help, they don't know how to turn around that money and actually create lasting wealth. So those things, these issues I'm mentioning to you are 
interventions that are coming up in the near future by some organizations. Now, I mean, much cannot be said about those things now because it needs to come to proper fruition. But that is what research has shown about traffic people, people migrants across all the countries that have these issues that are going on. Because Nigeria is not just, it's not the only country that is currently dealing with this crisis. But Nigeria seems to have a high number. And, you know, to answer the question earlier on about number of, you know, the traffic, imagine when, as of 2016, Nigeria had over 11,000 girls and women who were trafficked I was going to suppose that was 2016. We're talking 2020 going to 2021 now. That number would have quadrupled. But in all, one of the things that needs to happen is that even the young people themselves, like we have seen recently, need to take up a sense of responsibility and ownership for their lives. And what can we do? How do we get government to listen? What are the opportunities that we can begin to put in place? Where are they? Because the international community, I can authoritatively tell you, is truly looking for ways to be able to reintegrate and also make sure that Nigerians that have, that are especially returnees, have a place to come back to. And one of those things, one gap, which the Edo state government is trying to see and fill, because I have done research in this, is the provision of shelter. When Timothy will tell you, when on coming back home, what next? He was promised, you know, the NGO promised him We'll do this, we'll do that. But most of the interventions so far to date have simply been about, you know, we bring you back and we talk to you and we encourage you. Motivational speak. But now we're looking at proper psychosocial support. People that have been traumatized, then shelter, then, like I said earlier on, access to finance and setting up businesses, as well as in employment opportunities. But people need to be properly skilled and trained for this. The journey is still... Quite um long, I must say. And the work to be done there is, is still, a lot, and there isn't even enough hands in the field. There's still a lot. There's still a lot of, of um, and migration. There's still a lot more, you know, that we, that needs to be talked about, you know, with this um, conversation. Um, there is, of course, the idea of prosecuting those people in Nigeria that are responsible for sending fellow Nigerians. <laughs> Um, out there to suffer and, and to, of course, to the desert and to be sold into sexual uh, slavery and, and forced labor and all of that. There's so much more. Um, we also shouldn't forget the fact, uh, the fact of um, organ harvesting and uh, that part of the conversation that, of course, is very relevant. But I want to ask Timothy, what are you skilled in? When you were leaving the country, what skills were you hoping would help you survive outside Nigeria? Now that you're back, what skills do you have? What, what's your level of education? What things can you use uh, to help make yourself better? Actually, 2010, um, I graduated from Federal College of Fisheries and Marine Technology. Um, on the nautical science, I sailed for a couple of months and it's been contract basis and that was it. Since then, you go to Nemasa, give them your, your credentials. They tell you to come. And all of a sudden, they tell you, oh, sorry, the job opportunity is not there. Remembering, uh, before I could take this both step to do this, I remember then uh, in Yaradua's regime, there's this point we gave, the, he gave them points, this agenda, poverty alleviation and job creation. I went to the Lagos State, um, um, what's it called, uh, Empowerment um, Office here, and uh, only for me to speak with the lady that was in charge of giving them opportunities for us to, to sell, for us to have, um, the, there's this program that was set aside, like those that come out from these maritime academies, we could still sponsor them abroad, give them more, more quality um, kind of experience and let them sell here. Only for me to get there, the lady was telling me, that sorry, it's not that the form you correct, you the form are, are with me, but it's been sold. I like something that's supposed to be a benefit to us is been sold. How much is it? He said, No, sorry, even the last form is, is right here in my locker, but someone has already bought it. And I, I saw those things on TV, saw those guys that went, majority of them are not even uh maritime students. And you know, you just look at it like, okay, what hope have I got? I, if I don't have uh, nobody, I don't have no connections. I can't make it in my country. So that was more reasons why I decided to take that boost step. Like, I want to go out there. Uh, I, if I could get there, I could showcase what I've got, to, what, what, what alert I've got. I could just, you know, tell them this is all, probably 
or enlighten myself or probably go to Moscow and do all these things to make sure that I live a better life. Amen. More is his wife. Timothy, I, I, I truly believe that there's so back. much more to yes. talk about. Timothy, uh, there's so much more yeah. to talk about. We understand, we have a sense of what you're trying to explain to us and uh, we wish you the very best of luck going forward. And um, of course, uh, Enito Ibironke, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and your time on this very touchy conversation. Thank you. Timothy, thank you as well. You know, a couple of things I'd like to just highlight. Nigeria is not just a transit point. It's a source point. It's a destination point. It's a point for all the kinds of atrocities that you can't even begin to imagine actually transpire when it comes to you know, human trafficking, trafficking. Uh, in humans. But something Anita said that I really think we need to pay attention to, and that is social security. It sense that when a man is down, He's not completely down. You don't need to uh, depend on handouts when people don't even have enough for themselves, not to talk of giving handouts. So government must pay beyond lip service, beyond 20,000 naira, beyond 30,000 naira, have a, a way that helps people. Some people have good jobs. And then for some reason, okay, now we have a COVID-19 situation. A lot of people will be out of jobs. This NSAS situation also made a lot of hardworking industrious Nigerians, jobless, what are the measures that are in place to help them, you know, find, I mean, a gap, a, a, a gap point that will help them before they get back on their feet, find another job? How are they going to survive? It's almost like a jungle when you have no sort of sense of social security. And because these people see that you go to other places, you have Unemployment benefits, you have all kinds of benefit, you know, that will help you until you are able to find your feet again. And there, there, there are people you see that when they get back on your feet, they pay back to the government Doesn't because the government was there for them. So um, I know we talk about this a whole lot, but it is of utmost importance that our government stop playing politics when it comes to the issue of social security and the welfare of citizens because... Like a lot of persons have said, if we do not do our due diligence, we will see worse situations in this country where people will say, I am done. Whatever is, is. Hello. Hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.